Good morning, wherever you may be. Welcome to today's uh, Cichlids and Coffee. And wherever you may be, hope you're having a cup of uh, a cup of Joe or whatever your favorite beverage is. If I can get a uh, sound and video check from someone out there, let me know that, that I'm coming through loud and clear while some folks get on. Hey, James, looks like you were first on the chat, James. If you don't have, you have a set of stickers? If you don't have a set of stickers, James, send me your mailing address to ben.o.cichlid at gmail, and uh, you'll get your early bird channel stickers. So uh, send me your mailing address, and I'll get those out to you. If you would like a set. Basically, it's the channel logo and the uh, Cichlids and Coffee logo. So, uh, welcome, James, and welcome, Neil, and Flying Fish, and Gus Frazier, Predator Haps, love that name. Z-Zip is here. Hey, GP, thank you for showing up, GP. Your uh, help on these live streams is greatly appreciated, as is my other moderator here. I noticed Jerry, Jerry is also here. Check out Jerry's Fish Room. He's putting out some good content, trying to get the channel off the ground. Check out Jerry's Fish Room, and... Uh, Let's give that channel a bump. Alex, hello, Alex and Amber and uh, John. Hey, John Wallace. Thank you so much for showing up, my friend. Emmons here. Thank you, Emmons from the UK. And Shannon is here. And hey, Frank, my friend. ¿Cómo estás, amigo? Mucho gusto en verte aquí. En verte aquí. Brian is here. And Amber, John. Okay. Hey, Denny. Denny, thank you for uh, joining us. Another moderator. And it looks like Ed is here from Ed's. What is that? Picking up, picking up cichlids. Love that. Picking up cichlids, and it's loud and clear. Okay, good. Thank you so much for that uh, AV check, and thank you, Gene, to you too, and Guillermo. And let's see. All right. Hey, KP. KP is here. Ray Cooper's here. Ray, a loyal fan of the channel. Thank you, Ray for showing up and <clears throat> let's go ahead slim tim is fired up <laughs> that's good slim tim i like that so um let's go ahead and get into some of the stuff here and um i have to na navigate on my terminal here looking through my microphone so um let's go ahead and do the uh the official the official start of the live stream. Let's pay some, let's pay some bills. Uh, if you <laughs> if you're new to the channel, be sure to hit that sub button and the uh, like. Hit be sure hit that like and uh, the bell. Thank you for doing that in advance. We're we're this close to forty thousand. We're about to hit forty thousand. That's that's pretty exciting. I appreciate you doing that. And uh, also, uh, some uh, a shout out to my channel sponsor, the Cichlid Shack in Tempe, Arizona. Once you go shack, you never go back. <laughs> uh, shack Attack Ten will give you a ten percent discount on anything you buy, uh, and uh, if you buy a hundred dollars in fish. Use Shack Attack 15, all lowercase, Shack Attack 15, one word, and you get 15% off on your fish. And um, for those of you who want to support the channel, uh, use my Amazon link to get to Amazon. You can pick up coffee mugs, teas, and sweats, sweatshirts, hoodies, things like that. Anything you buy on Amazon, uh, by the way, I mean... I got it backwards. Amazon is anything you buy from my Amazon store or anywhere on Amazon gives a credit to the channel. And if you visit my Teespring store, you can pick up hoodies and teas and, co and coffee. And be sure to use live stream as a code at the Teespring store because you'll get 10% 10 off at the, at the store. And one last, one last thing is uh, for those of you, uh, some of you might be aware of this already, but I have uh, started a Patreon channel or a Patreon uh, account. And uh, it's going to be um, 
Let me go ahead and pull it up here. If you see this under the banner of the channel, that logo, that P uh, in a bar in a circle, that's Patreon. And there's going to be devil, different levels of, of membership starting at about $3 a month. So if you'd like to uh, support the channel, uh, go to my Patreon page. And um, that's going to help fund the final build out of this uh, fish room, ripping out of things. And uh, also trips to faraway fish stores, uh, fish conventions, uh, upgrading equipment, things of that nature. It's all, uh, it all costs. So uh, consider becoming a Patreon. We already have some members already. Thank you very much to those of you who are already Patreon members. And uh, the Patreon, certain levels of Patreon, by the way, will get you a tea and a hoodie and a coffee mug. These are uh, Garage Gang, Garage Gang swag and... Uh, so just something to keep in mind. If you if you if you can, if you can, great. If you can't, that's okay too. This is the link. That's the link to the uh, Patreon. I'm just playing it there on the screen. If you can, if if you're interested, you can do that. So um, that pays the bill. Thank you for the indulging me in this commercial. There is a video at Patreon that you can watch that talks about why I did it and uh, gives a little bit more background information. So you can check that out there at, at Patreon. So let's get into the topic here. And uh, I wanna talk about water changes. I and I tell you why, as, as you start to add more tanks, of course, unless you have an automatic water change system, as you start to add more tanks, water change, what you're changing, doing a water change starts to become, uh, of course, more time and more labor intensive. So I realized while doing water changes, especially on a tank like this, 210 gallons with a sump, as I started to do water changes, I realized that a lot of my routine, a lot of my water routine, the water change routine was really based on just uh that's just the way i've always done it there was no there, there was no science necessarily behind it there was no um thought or logic or measurement behind it it was i always do i always do water changes now you could make a case you could make it you could argue well if if things are working if things are working why change them uh if you're getting good results uh, why why change anything? Okay, that's that's a valid argument. I could see that. I could see that. At the same time, what if I'm doing something that is unnecessary? Not only unnecessary, but what if by doing by doing it unnecessarily, am I putting my fish uh, in any way at risk, and also taking up time and effort for me? that I could be doing, you know, could be enjoying my fish, watching them or doing other things, right? So I started thinking about it. And, um, and I realized that, you know, I, I, I haven't, it's really been, it's almost like, you know, superstition. Superstition is something that, you know, people just sort of, they don't have an explanation for something. So, you know, when there's a full moon, the gods are mad, you know, so we get, we get superstition, right, going. And so, and so, because people can't explain it, so they come up with something. So, um, I've always done it that way. It's always worked for me. I mean, it 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 kind of starts to get a little bit into habit and superstition and things. That, so, I said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start testing. So I started. I, I got these great strips. They were sent to me by my friends over at the Aquarium Co-op. And some of you are familiar with these. Very easy to use, very easy to read. Unlike the um, the Tetra strips or the or the six and ones, they don't have the pullout sheet that eventually gets wet and and discolors. It's uh, it's ju it's just very easy to. To get your to get your findings and uh, the instructions are very clear, and so I started using these strips. 
Now, Jerry, over at Jerry's Fish Room, I think did a, um, a, a comparison between, I think between these and perhaps the API master test kit. And I don't know, Jerry, did you, did you do the test strips? Uh, did you do the Tetra six and ones? I mean, uh, he did a, he did a side by side. So if you want to see how they test it out against each other, I know from my experience, the API master test kit was testing routinely uh, too high on nitrates. And I did a video a while back where I compared Salifert and uh, the CCAM nitrate test kit and the API uh, master test kit. And the API was always way high on nitrates. And I started to get very suspicious. And, uh, you know, the, the, the conspiracy person in me came out. <laughs> I said, you know, API is trying to sell me more water conditioner. So they're... <laughs> They're trying to frighten me into, into doing more work here and buying more of their products. So at any rate, I, I, I did these tests, and it turned out that my nitrates were not as, as high as I thought they were. Then I did more research and discovered that nitrates over 20 parts per million uh, is not a death sentence. I mean, if you listen to some fish keepers uh, out there, you would think that if your nitrates were over 10 parts per million, that your fish were all going to die. You start doing some research, and you realize that there's some folks out there that have been running for years between 40 and 80, 40 and 100 parts per million. I'm not suggesting you do that. All I'm saying is that there are folks out there that uh, run at those levels and report that they don't really have a problem, they don't really see issues, blah, 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 right? So um, so I decided to go ahead and before I do a test or before I do a, uh, a water change, to go ahead and start testing. This tank was testing out at 10 parts per million. So, you know, I was just about ready to do a water change and I, and I, I said, wait a minute, I'm at 10 parts per million. Now, just a word of caution. Don't wait until you get 40, 60, 80, 100 parts per million, if that makes you very uncomfortable. However, if you're at 10 parts per million, you might be taking an unnecessary step. Now, one of the reasons why this tank perhaps runs so low in nitrates, and yet is, is, it's pretty well stocked. It's not as stocked as it's going to be. But... Um, when you have a sump, your sump goes down, it evaporates, it gets evaporation. You've got that pump in there working, and you've got a lot of cascading water and blah, blah. So you get a lot of evaporation going. And so that, that sump requires 10 to 15 gallons of top-off once, sometimes twice a week. And so you're doing that kind of a top-off, and so you are adding fresh you know, nitrate-free water to the tune of about 30 gallons uh, a week. So this tank is running pretty low on nitrates just off top-offs. So um, I tested the other tanks. The other tanks uh, needed uh, the 90-gallon needed a, a top-off or needed a, a water change. These tanks behind me only had one, fi one fish in them each. I just have a couple place. Uh, placeholders, right? Just keeping the tank alive while I'm waiting for more fish to come in. I have a green severum in, in, in one of the 55s. That's going to be for, for South Central New World cichlids. And then I've got a, a, uh, I've got the dragon blood behind me. So those tanks with one fish in a 55, they don't, they don't need weekly, they don't need weekly uh, water changes. But that's always the way I do it. And so there's, there's this, there's this part of me that's like, I got to do a water change. You know, it's almost like a compulsion, an obsession. I've got to do a water change. Uh, so I had to step back and go, okay, let's test this and, and let's, let's apply some logic to it, right? It's, it's a fluid situation, right? Fish keeping is a fluid situation. You've heard me say that before. You have less stock. You should need less water changes, if you're feeding less, you should need less water changes. If you're feeding more, if you're adding, let's say I start adding a frozen krill, I'm going to start giving these, 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 
these big boys, frozen krill. That frozen krill, the parts that don't get eaten and get stuck in the in the foliage, you know, the plants and the under the under the caves or whatever. I mean, that's going to create that's going to create some ammonia. That's going to create some nitrates. So again, it, it's it's a fluid situation that should always be monitored, and not just be, not just fall into a a uh, set in concrete pattern that never that is this way now and forever. And so as a result, I was able to to um, skip a water change on the big tank. I was able I, I did some work on the filters of the ninety. So I didn't do a water change there. Again, just to disrupt things less, I didn't do a water change on the 55s because I'd done one last week and there's only one fish in there. I did test strips, tests on all the tanks, and they all tested out perfect. So despite every, every, every habit, like, like biting your nails or fiddling with your ear or, you know... <laughs> It's like a habit that I every every habit cell in my body was saying, change the water. It's been a week, you know. Uh, I said, well, step back here, because when I get eight or nine or ten or twenty tanks, that's not going to be practical unless I put in some type of a of a mass automatic water change system. So, I started applying a little logic to it, a little common sense to it, and. Um, and it 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 just it just feels better now. It feels more sensible. It feels less driven by by habit and compulsion and obsession, and more driven by what do my fish need. Now, all that being said, I'm not making a case for you skipping a water change and then writing me an email saying Ben, my fish died because my my ammonia spiked and it's because of you. <laughs> if what you're doing is working, continue doing what you're doing. However, all I'm saying, all I'm throwing out there is that if we fall into a habit, always be willing to step back and re-examine that habit because it is a fluid situation. Less stock, less food, more stock, more food. You've added a hang on back. You've added a canister. That should require, you're, you're, you're filtering more. So... Your fish are bigger. You know, these fish, if I didn't add another fish in about six months to nine months, I'm going to have more ammonia production because these fish are, some of these fish are going to be adding four or five inches to their size. In some cases, like in the case of the trout, even more. So again, it, it's, it's like, it's like, um, just 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 staying staying frosty on the whole thing just just staying sharp and current and not just becoming a um, a creature entirely of habit but thinking with with your circumstances you know it it was that that creature of habit thing that got me in trouble with the 90 gallon because i was i, I was medicating i messed with the filters I, I, you know, and then I did my, my routine water change. I shouldn't have done the water. I should have left the water change alone. I should have left it alone. And, uh, and, and quite honestly, I probably should have left the filters alone. Instead, I messed with too much and I created a spike, a momentary spike, but enough of a spike in ammonia that killed off a couple of my favorite fish. And uh, so part of this is a consideration of what we call the risk reward. You have the risk reward factor, right? What's the reward of a, of a water change? Reduced nitrates, fresh water, minerals, water clarity. Uh, there's a lot of great, great reasons to do a water change. What's the uh, what's the risk? What's the downside? The downside is you make a mistake. You're, someone turns on the, the dishwasher or the washing machine or takes a hot shower in the middle of filling the tank and you're, all of a sudden your water temperature, if you're using a hose system, uh, changes dramatically and you shock your fish with a temperature uh, change. Now, that's harder to do in big aquariums. The advantage of big aquariums is that it's harder to shock the fish with stuff like that. But if you have a, a, a 20, a 40, 
and uh, you've done a 60% water change and that water temperature goes to, you know, 65 degrees because someone, because someone started the dishwasher, you could chalk your fish. You, you forget to condition the water. That, that has resulted in problems for people. Uh, there's a dramatic change in pH. If your fish, let's say your fish are flashing, you, you, uh, you do a water change and your fish are rubbing themselves against the, the substrate, against the rocks. They're shimmying, they're shaking, they're like vibrating real quick and, and they're rubbing themselves against things. Sometimes that can be because you, you've done a pH shift. If that's happening uh, on a regular basis for you during water changes, Instead of a 60% water change, do a couple 30% water changes. You know, do, do it twice a week, 30%. Don't do a 60%. And fill your tank slowly. Let the water go in a little bit slower so there's a little bit more acclimation going on as opposed to gushing it in there on a 70% water change, 80% water change, and then watching the fish go momentarily crazy with a lot of shaking and 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 rubbing against things that's just telling you hey look something doesn't feel right um, I, i'm trying to get something off of me because it doesn't feel right and it's probably a ph shift so uh just things to take just things to keep in mind you know a, a, as part of you know we we get into routines we get into habits and then we just continue with these habits even though the science and the circumstances have changed. Now, that being said, how, how am I doing water changes currently? All of my water changes are being run from the garage sink through a, a hose system. I have this hose and I have a 100-foot uh, a hose. So the hoses siphon the water out and the hoses, you know, right to the sink, and the hoses fill up the tanks. So I'm going right from the tap. Because of that, I treat for the entire volume of the tank. So if I was treating this tank here with, um, with Prime or, or Fritz Complete, currently I'm using Fritz Complete. If I was, if I was treating with this, I would have to use... Um, four capful, 50, 50 gallons per capful, four and maybe even five, even though you do lose some gallons with your, with the amount of decor, I'd probably use four or five caps of this in a tank this size. Now, this is why for my bigger tanks, I don't treat with uh, liquid. I treat with uh, Seachem Safe. This is Seachem Safe. And Seachem Safe a quarter teaspoon treats uh, 300 gallons, 300 gallons. So I use two thirds, two thirds of a quarter teaspoon. <laughs> Those of you real good with measurements, what is two thirds of a quarter teaspoon? So I use two thirds of a quarter teaspoon in a cup of, of water and that treats the entire tank. And, uh, I also, to my uh, African cichlid tank, I add a little bit of cichlid lake salt, which is essentially um, trace minerals. I don't add the full dose because I think the full dose is um, it's just too much. I'd go through like a bottle of this every two weeks. So instead, I, I just put a, a couple of heaping tablespoons of this stuff. I dissolve it in water and I, you know, gently pour it in. And what it does is it gives them uh, trace minerals as nutrition. The minerals, they get their minerals from, from water, the osmosis of the, the, you know, the, the exchange that occurs between the tank water and their body, and that they're getting a lot of their mineral uh, supplementation that way. So I add trace minerals in the form of these, these uh, lake salts. Do I add regular salt? No, I add. I do use salt for um, uh, treatment, like bloat, or if I see a little bloat, I pull them out, put some salt in there. That tends to kind of alleviate it. Um, 
So I do use salt, like Fritz A1 salt. I'll use that, but I don't add salt on a regular basis. And uh, I just use the, uh, the trace minerals. So that's how, that's how I do my water changes. They're all done directly from the tap. I have a digital thermometer that I use to measure the temperature. And when I do a large water change, I check the temperature several times during the water change to make sure it didn't shift on me or to make sure that the hot water heater didn't kick in and, 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 and heat things up more and things of that nature. So I am checking temperature as I do the, as I fill the tank. And, um, I used to get flashing back in, uh, back in, in Arcadia in Los Angeles. I used to get flashing after a water change that stopped when I reduced the percentage of water change. It also stopped when I started filling up the tank a little bit more slowly. So I do suspect it was a pH difference creating a little bit of irritation. And I haven't had any flashing here after water changes. Currently, my water changes are around 30%. However, I will increase the water change. Like this water change, the next water change on this tank will be a little bit more because my, um, my Phoenix, my Phoenix has a little bit of a cloudy eye. And in my mind, there's nothing better for a cloudy eye than fresh water. So I'll probably do a slightly larger water change. Here's the Phoenix back here. It's very minor, just at the top, but I'll, I'll do a little bit more just to give him a little bit more fresh water. And, I'll, and I'm doing slightly larger water changes in the South Americans because my geophagus, their fins, their tail fins, which I suspect started with them nipping each other, their tail fins are deteriorating a little bit. So I removed two of them and put them in quarantine in a separated 29 with a divider. And I put some Furon 2 in there. I also have some Marison, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm giving them big water changes. And the two that are in quarantine are responding well. I still have one in the 90. I'll pull that one out after the other two are better. And I'll swap, swap him out with one of the other two. They were just nipping each other like crazy. C. Wood. 0.167 of a teaspoon. Thank you, Seawood. <laughs> I love mathematics. Yeah. Right? So, always remember when you do a water change, you are stressing your fish. You know, you're messing with stuff, you're vacuuming, the fish are darting around, they're afraid. Um, you're, you open the door to a possible forgetfulness of forgetting to condition the water, forgetting to temperature match correctly. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a risk, there's a certain risk factor. So any place where we can reduce the risk a little bit. So again, not the case for skipping or not doing water changes, just a case for occasionally evaluating your habits and routines and asking yourself with the use of things like test strips, asking yourself, is my routine sensible and, and needed? Or am I just doing it out of habit and superstition? All right? So let me hear what you have to say about this in the comments. I noticed the uh, chat has been quite, uh, uh, quite lively here. Let's take a look here. And I don't know if I missed a super chat because I wasn't watching. Got about 121 people on. That's good. And um, Alex has got his African cichlids in a 125. I'm assuming that's a 125 with a six a six foot uh, across footprint. Uh, I mean, it's just it's a game changer, really, for these guys. Let's see here. Amber Key, I agree, Amber Key. It's amazing uh, how far away people are on these, on these uh, live streams. I love it. A Guillermo de Leon. Guillermo de Leon, 100 gallon. I don't do many water changes. FX6 with four liters of Seachem Matrix. Also FX4, 
full of Kemi Pure Blue and Purigen. Interesting. And Guillermo, do you do water tests? How are your water tests? How do they look? What are your nitrates at? I'd be curious. And also, uh, how often are you doing water changes? So let's see here. Jerry's fish room, nine tanks, a lot of water changes. <laughs> Yeah, after a while, you pay the price for multi-tank syndrome, right? I mean, you just, it's a lot, it's a, it's a lot of time and work. Now, I love doing it. You know, I'm one of those folks that actually enjoys the, the maintenance part of the hobby. I find it um, very therapeutic. You know, it's it, you know, just manual labor. There's something very therapeutic about gardening, working on your car, uh, you know, cleaning your tanks. There's just... There's just something about it, and then you you see the results immediately. And anyway, I I, I really like that guy. To me, I, I love it. James Green, ironic topic. I do that. <laughs> okay, James. I hope I gave you something to think about on on the topic. And uh, Alex does a sixty percent water change every Sunday. It's by habit. Yeah, and you know what? If it's working, your fish are healthy, they're colorful, they're eating, they're active. Uh, you know me. I mean, don't change it if it's working. But at the same time, from time to time, it's good to take inventory and just go, wait a minute. I have twice the stock I had uh, six months ago, and the fish are all bigger. Maybe I need to go with a, another water change or maybe a bigger water change. Or let me take some... or. I am feeding more now, so maybe I need to add another filter. I mean, again, it's a fluid situation. You have a lot of moving parts that we, we have to just stay on our toes about. So um, Amber Key, no science, just habits when it comes to water changes. Open to new ideas. Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, if it's working, it's working. Okay, let me go to the more current comments here. And if I missed your comment or question, I'm sorry. James, thank you so much for that super chat, my friend. Very appreciate it. James Green comes in with a super chat. What is that, a duck? Is that Daffy Duck? <laughs> One of my favorite cartoon characters. Uh, let's see here. If you have any questions that you want to ask me directly, now is the time. Uh, Cranium Rex, I am using Salifert NO3 test. I have nine tanks, so using API is a major workout. Love the Salifert test. Now, now you know, it, it's, it, it's funny, but hey, Orbaglio, didn't know you were here. Welcome to the uh, stream. And uh, also Frankie. Fingers is here, and Vaughn Lurker. So um, I, I contacted the folks at Salifert, and and they say, well, you know, it, it's, it, it, it used to be, they used to say it was exclusively for salt water, uh, but I did some more research. I found that a lot of folks were using the Salifert for fresh water and, uh, and didn't see any reason why it wouldn't work. Now I think Salifert has a uh, fresh water line, and... Uh, so if you folks are not aware of Salifert products, you can pick them up, I believe, at uh, BulkReefSupply or Saltwater.com. I mean, lots of places out there. And uh, it's good. Uh, Gobrian44, Ben, do you use uh, probiotics or additives? I use uh, some foods like cobalt. The cobalt foods have probiotics in them. So I do mix uh, cobalt. The cobalt predator pellets has a probiotic in it. So I guess indirectly, yes, I do. Neil, Neil Grace, uh, Grace Mark, 180 US gallons for two FX6. Water change when the tank tells me, but I keep a close eye on the fish. Longest time without a water change, uh, four months with testing. Now, the only 
The only downside to that, Neil, in my mind, would be a drop in mineralization. Something that, that um, I became aware of is that minerals don't stay suspended in the water column where the fish can access them, you know, uh, through, you know through, their, through the scales. So eventually those minerals will, will, will settle on the bottom and have to be uh, replaced in the water column, and that replacement usually occurs with um, usually occurs with a water change. So uh, that would be my only reluctance on uh, because there's other things besides the things that we test for that water changes will help with. And the big one in my mind is a, um, a, a an adding of minerals to the water. Now, if you're adding minerals. If you're if you're actually adding minerals, you're adding products. Uh, you're adding products like the cichlid, like the cichlid salt, and perhaps you have uh, limestone, limestone and uh, aragonite, crushed coral, that isn't real, real old. Those are adding calcium, magnesium to your water. I noticed that that. Um, Corey over at the aquarium co-op was putting a certain amount of crushed coral in, in most of the tanks, including South American, Central American, right? Uh, community tanks, because it's a great source of uh, calcium and magnesium. So if you go for a long time without a water change, that, that can add, add it to it. And um, looks like somebody jumped in here with a, Flying or Florida, New York, <laughs> flying fish comes in with a super chat. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. So Scott Kushner uh, just did a water change in my 75 gallon. If, if I don't, I noticed bacterial infection will occur if I do the water change, everything remains good with the fish. That's that's um that's interesting, Scott. I haven't heard that before. That if someone doesn't it, it I would I would be curious as to what is the source of that bacteria. Now if you have a, a 3D background, I would I would check behind the background. Do you have a large waste? accumulation there if you have a, a large amount of decor i would check under your decor to see if you have a an accumulation of waste it's amazing how it can get under rocks and uh, other under ornaments right because you you shouldn't have a um an automatic bacterial breakout that shouldn't be happening and uh Kind of reminded me of, of um, I'm not saying this is your situation, but there was a, a person that commented on one of the blogs. It wasn't at the at the Ben O. Apostrophe Cichlid Facebook page. It was at a different, a different group. Too many cichlids, or all about cichlids, or one of the, one of those other Facebook groups. Somebody said, "My tank stinks. What can I do?" And uh, immediately, people just said, "Hey, look, your tank shouldn't stink." Your your tank shouldn't have a bad smell, so yeah, you can you you can add activated char you know activated carbon, but there's 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 something going on. You have a dead fish that's wedged under a rock somewhere, or uh, or hidden in some plant. So you have something in one of your filters that 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 is putrid. You shouldn't have a stinky tank. You should be able to put your nose right up against the water. And uh, and it smells fine. You, you, it should be you should you should be willing to drink that water. That's that's how how pure and clean. It should be some of the cleanest water around. All the filtration and and uh, I'm not suggesting you drink it. All I'm saying is it. <laughs> so if it stinks, something's not right. Something is not right. So um, all right, let's see here. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead and and bring them on. And. Uh,
So Tetra Guy TX, I have a heavily planted freshwater tank, and and it, you're still doing the water changes to avoid the algae, the algae from breaking out. And I'm, I'm wondering how long do you leave your lights on? Is your tank near a window? Because there's other ways to control that algae. Because it would seem to me that you're if you have a heavily planted tank, your plants are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. One of the, uh, you know, they're, they're consuming a lot of the ammonia, and uh, they do consume ammonia, which results in, of course, less, less nitrate, right? And, I mean, in a cichlid tank, of course, like this one, you can't have the plants because they get destroyed. So um, I don't have plants doing the work, so the work has to be done manually, and that's with water changes, okay? So... Um, I'm just wondering how long you're leaving your lights on because I know with this tank here, I started leaving the lights on a little bit longer and I immediately had a, you can see almost, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but right here I have a little bit of a bloom of brown algae right in here. And I mean, that's a good thing. It means you have a living ecosystem, right? Algae breakouts show you that, okay, good. This is, it's becoming uh, the, the seasoned tank that Corey talks about, right? It's becoming more seasoned when you have that algae bloom. At the same time, on the front panel, it is ugly. I do leave it alone on the back. If I get algae blooms on the back of my tank, I don't touch them. They do consume. They consume nitrates, right? They consume uh, ammonia. They release oxygen. So algae is a good thing. So let's see here. So Slim Tim, you see Slim, that's what I'm talking about. It's... it's um, we we're operating off of off of theory and gut feeling. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, very often our theories and gut feelings are really good. But um, you know, try try some testing. Uh, take a look at your tank and compare it to what it was six months ago. If it's if it's more heavily stocked, if you're feeding more, if it's more lightly stocked, if you added more filtration, again, all these moving parts, the fluid situation, and then ask yourself, wait a minute. Do I need 20 to 60? Maybe I need to do 80. Maybe I can always go 20. Maybe I can skip a week, right? So again, let, uh, yeah, go with what seems right. But also, you know, from time to time, take a step back and go, well, let me see if I might be putting my fish through unnecessary stress or creating opportunities for errors to end up hurting my my tank in some way so just something to think about that's all thank thank you frankie for pushing the uh thumbs up <laughs> promoting the thumbs up i'm going through the chat here folks Russ Frazier, Predator Haps. My routine is a 75% water change weekly. Scrub the glass, vacuum out the waste, change my activated carbon every four or five weeks, and I do a canister maintenance uh, once every four months. That sounds solid. That sounds solid, Gus. Um, yeah, you definitely want to do all the housekeeping. You know, I like to get a... Um, I like to get a the housekeeping done. In other words, get any vacuuming, um, scrubbing down of the artificial plants, cleaning the glass panels. Get all that done first, because inevitably that's going to create uh, part particles floating in the water. Right? Then I do the water change. Then I, I draw the water out of the tank because I'll be drawing a lot of the stuff that's floating in the water column. So I try and do the housekeeping chores first the vacuuming, the cleaning of plants and the glass, then pull all the water out. And, and then of course, treat for the full volume of the tank and then drop the hose in and start filling it up. On this tank here, I'm probably gonna end up, I have an old Aquion uh, pump. I'm probably gonna end up a submersible pump. I'm probably gonna end up dropping a pump in this thing to speed out the draining process because using a, a standard, Using one standard size hose like this, I mean, you know, what is this? A half inch? 
I mean, it, 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 it takes a long time to get 30% out of this tank and uh, an equally long time to fill it up. So if I can, if I can speed up the, the draining part of it, after I'm keeping in mind that some of it has drained with the vacuuming, right? So I am probably going to start using a submersible pump. David Cousineau, can anyone recommend the best treatment for sunken belly? My fish are acting fine. Thanks in advance. Is it one fish, David, or do you have several fish that are sunken? And um, certainly if you can get a food that has, I think, was, was there a medicine called, was it snip or snipe? It was a, a medicine called Snipe. There's also um, uh, there's a parasite. There's a, a Fritz Paracleanse. Some people will use General Cure. If it's all the fish, you'll have to do a general treatment, of course, to the whole tank, which is probably not a bad idea if you suspect a parasite. Are you getting stringy, uh, almost see-through uh, poops? Are the fish pooping long, stringy, uh, almost almost transparent uh, poops if that's the case yeah yeah you've got you've got a uh, parasite in there and you need to do something i would treat the entire tank because you know what these fish do right i mean one fish poops and 20 fish will put it in its mouth and spit it out so it's probably widespread so just treat the whole tank it will get expensive if you, you're treating a, a big tank it's going to get expensive but Probably cheaper than uh, having all the fish die off on you. The other thing is watch to see if they're eating. I mean, are they eating enough? Maybe you're not feeding them enough. They, they might just be skinny. That's also a possibility. Some people are uh, so afraid of bloat that they underfeed. Or you have a couple dominant fish that are getting the lion's share of the food and not letting the other fish get to it. And if that's the case, you're going to have a couple fish with a sunken belly. Those fish will also be under stress, so the parasites that probably exist in every fish are going to become more, more active and, and, and take a bigger toll on a fish that is stressed than they are. I think, I think almost every fish has, as well as every human, has some parasites that live in them. The question is, are they getting out of control and out of hand? And if the fish is stressed and being bullied and not able to even get to the food, yeah, you're going to have sunken bellies. I had a beautiful eye biter back in Los Angeles. Eight inches, eight inch, nine inch, big eye biter. Some of you remember that fish. Gorgeous fish. I used to feed him at the corner of the tank separately. I would give him pieces of frozen krill. He would eat two or three chunks Always colorful, always active, um, always had a sunken belly. I pulled him out of the tank. I put him in a quarantine tank. I treated with, uh, you know, paracleans and, and things of that nature. He was eating. His poops looked normal. Put him back in the tank. Sunken belly. Always, it was just almost like genetically, like, like those people that can eat anything and they're always skinny. So maybe genetically, this fish just had that type of shape. I don't know what it was, but he was always healthy, always ate well. I end up selling him to somebody. He's probably still doing great, and uh, but he always had that little bit of sunken belly. So there's always that as well. And we drive ourselves crazy, you know? All right. Hey, Mary Page Flynn. Good to see you here. Tropical fish tanks on a collie. Welcome to the stream. Sharpie models and aquatics. Hello. Let's see here. Alex Dewar. That's why I changed. This must be in a conversation that's going on, a separate conversation going on in the chat here. Uh, yes, Alex. Uh, that's also why. I now prefer the the Velomax because, uh, as I talked about, I think in last week's live stream, 
when I had that outbreak of uh, Colomeris and found out that it will uh, breed and, and multiply on waste. So I just went on a waste hunt and I pulled the, the uh, universal, uh, uh, it was called, I think, Rocky Thin background, just a little half inch background. It was beautiful, but at the back of my 180, I pulled it back and I had about an inch and a half of just built up stuff. Now, I have also heard a theory that after a while, that waste becomes inert. In other words, it just stops being of, of any type of concern. It, it doesn't do anything. It isn't the nitrate factory that, that, that people might think it is. So there's different, there's different camps, different thoughts on it. Uh, but if it's inert with regards to nitrates, can it still serve as a, as a Petri dish, right, as a source of nutrition for a bacteria like Colomeris? If that's the case, then you certainly want to get it out of there. And so I pulled that that uh, background out, vacuumed, lifted all the decor, found a lot of waste under the decor, which shocked me because the decor was pushed all the way down to the glass with, with sand all around it, and there was still gunk that had worked its way under the rocks. Now, granted, in that tank, I had the artificial, the plastic rocks, from Universal Rocks. So they're very light, and um, I don't know. I don't know if that's one of the reasons why things were getting under there. But yeah, it had to be really cleaned out, and that's why I'm not using a, a 3D background now. And, and, uh, and they're very expensive. Very expensive. One of the uh, things I liked about that little tank that I did a review on was uh, that little uh, Hyger Horizon tank? I did. A, I just did a video on it. If you, if one of the moderators wants to uh, put the put the link on there, was that it comes with a real nice three D attached three D background, which I I bet you a dollar if I ordered that uh, a three D background that size from uh, Universal or Aqua Decor or someone like that, I'd probably pay. I'd probably pay a hundred bucks. For that background. Now, it's black and gray. It does take some space out of the tank. So you end up with, instead of eight gallons, you end up with essentially six gallons. However, you're not going to stock that tank too heavily. You're going to have a lot of plants in there. You're going to have a few little tetras, a few neons, and I'm going to attach some Anubias to it. After a while, it's going to get a little, uh, a little bit of... Uh, algae growing on it. It's going to look pretty good. So uh, watch for the video where I actually uh, show you that tank. I, excuse me. I should have it set up next week. I should be getting it set up. And James Largo, if you're listening, I know James is going to send me a few uh, smaller fish that I can put in there. And um, I know James is very busy. If he can't get to that, I, I'll probably end up just running over to Petco and just buying a few, uh, you know, dollar $2 neons, uh, a few zebras, a few rasboras, and uh, maybe a few more plants. I will send some plants from um, Aquarium Co-op. They sent me some Sprite and some uh, Anubias and uh, some swords. And so I got some real nice little plants I'm going to put in there. Anyway, should be kind of cool. Uh, so GP. Ray, I believe Ben uses the Python. Yes, I do use the Python. If you were talking about, do I do tap to tank? Yes, I do tap to tank. I do not lift buckets. And my lower back has been feeling much better since I got off the bucket brigade. I use the, the, the hose to empty the tank right from the tank to tap, right? You go backwards and you empty the tank and then I fill the tank right from the sink. I don't touch any buckets. I will use buckets when I'm rinsing sponges. For example, the pre-filter that's on the FX6, the sponges that are in the, uh, in the sump, things like that. I will rinse those in tank water. Even though someone just shared with me, and I think it was based on a video that was released by Jason at Primetime Aquatics, 
that if you do rinse those under tap water, you're not going to have a significant impact on the uh, aquarium. So you know what? Always be learning. <laughs> if I can rinse them in the tap, that would certainly be easier. But what I do now is I fill up a, a bucket, two-thirds, with tank water. I take my sponges in there, and I rinse them, and I put them right back in. And then I have to pick up a bucket and carry it to the sink and dump it. And uh, it's not too often, so it doesn't hurt my back as often as it used to. Jerry comes in with $5. Not only is he volunteering as a moderator, but he's throwing into the Super Chat. Thank you, my friend. And uh, like I said earlier, please check out Jerry's Fish Room. Uh, Ray, I do use a different hose for my quarantine tanks. I don't use the same hose for the quarantine tanks that I use for, the, for what you would call the show tanks. Alex, I agree. Get off the bucket brigade. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I was dreading water changes because I'd, I'd, I'd have to take eight or nine trips back and forth and then lifting them to fill and you always end up spilling some on the floor and, and even if you have towels. and So there's, there's always something, all right? So, yeah, I was glad. I was glad I uh, got off the bucket brigade. Hey, GP comes in with a super tat. Thank you, GP. You are truly a uh, truly a friend of the channel. And, uh, you know, in a perfect world, uh, Ray, in a perfect world, I think that, uh, yes, use separate hoses, separate nets for each tank. Have nets that you use only for each tank, just hanging right by that tank. Uh, try and keep things as separate as possible because cross-contamination is, uh, that's a real thing. It's a real thing. So at any rate, thank you everybody for uh, joining me in today's uh, live stream. I hope you uh, did get something out of it. If I missed your question or live chat or uh, super chat, I am sorry. I try and get to as many as I can. And for those of you who joined up late, um, there is a, um, I have started a Patreon. If you'd like to become a part of the Garage Gang, uh, visit, uh, click on the little P on the banner of my channel. It'll take you to my Patreon, and you can get in for about $3 a month, and a great way to support the channel. And um, I'm, I'm trying to build that up so I can do a, a, a tear out. I want to tear out the cabinetry. I want to put things that I have currently in bins in a monthly storage arrangement. And I want to get a backup camera, backup computer, some additional lights. There's other things I want to do. And, uh, you know, I've got that, uh, like my uh, mom used to say, I've got the champagne, the champagne taste with the beer budget. So, <laughs> so your help is appreciated. At any rate, that's that's all. I have for you right now. And, um, oh, by the way, one last thing. Uh, I, Lisa, I see you say dry out. When I finish using a hose in any one of my tanks, I do run scalding hot water through it, both through the outlet into the sink and the hose itself for several minutes. And I mean, my hot water heater uh, puts out volcanic water. So I run scalding hot water through it for several minutes uh, just as a precaution to help kill off anything that might be sitting in there. And then I let it dry out. So anyway, just something I do. So thank you, everybody. You are the best. You rock. If you'd like to see a video on a particular subject, go ahead and state it now in the chat. Uh, as part of the, today's wrap-up, I will look at it. And maybe your suggestion will be my next video. All right? Thank you, everybody. You are the best, and I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.